it is. And what you can do is to diversify away that risk, just start adding more and more assets to your portfolio. And as long as the companies are not perfectly correlated with each other, you get this power of diversification. And you can do it one of two ways, basically. One is you can go out and you can buy all these individual stocks yourself. And you can go through a broker, an investment advisor, and you can do that and put all these things in your portfolio, and you're going to pay different transactions costs for doing all these things. Uh, a simpler, more efficient, more effective way to do it that works for many investors is investing in mutual funds. Right? And what a mutual fund is, is a company that pulls together money from lots of investors, and they diversify, they take the money and invest in a bunch of different companies. Right? And we, the SEC, have been regulating mutual funds since 1940. And we have a lot of investor protections on mutual funds. For example, in the diversification uh, piece of that, uh, we have concentration limits. So mutual funds are not allowed to concentrate in a small number of companies. They have to be diversified. If you call yourself an equity fund or a stock fund, you have to primarily invest in stocks of company, which represents ownership in that company. If you call yourself a bond fund, you have to invest mostly in bonds of companies, which are essentially you're making loans to those companies uh, and they're paying you back uh, with interest. Or if you call yourself a money market fund, you have to be primarily invested in a bunch of money market, uh, very short-term type instruments. And so mutual funds are a way for individuals to get diversification very, very quickly. I mentioned their companies. And what the companies do is they offer to uh, buy and sell or exchange and redeem uh, your shares. You, you can do it directly through a mutual fund uh, company, or you can go through a broker or, or through uh, an investment advisor. In addition to uh, diversification, the other thing that mutual fund companies offer uh, investors is professional management. They will keep track of all the, what's called the net asset values and everything in the portfolio. So, so the, the shares of the mutual fund you transact at, it's basically a weighted average of everything that's in the fund minus some fees that they charge you for administering the fund. And most mutual funds, the fees have come way down in the last 10, 20 years due to competition. But that's probably the biggest difference or probably the biggest thing that investors need to, need to take into account is what are the fees and expenses that the funds are, um, are charging you. Now there's all kinds of different assets that they can invest in. I mentioned stock funds and bond funds and money market funds. There are things that are called blended funds, which can be a mix of stocks and bonds. They can invest in international securities. They can invest in all different types of things. And mutual fund companies offer a menu of choices that will fit your needs, whether you want to buy directly from them or whether you want to go through an investment professional uh, and try to figure out which ones uh, are the best for you. Uh, in, a different, in, in, in another dimension, one way to cut the difference between mutual funds is broadly broad categories of what's called active versus passive management. So passive management is uh, a fund that tracks an index and doesn't try to quote unquote beat the market. All they're trying to do, they call themselves, let's say an S&P 500 index fund or a Wilshire 3000 index fund and what they're trying to do is broadly match the indexes that have broad uh, appeal to investors. And for many people, uh, that's a very attractive one because you say, well, I don't know how to beat the market. I don't know how to pick the securities that are, that are better than any others in a particular industry, so why don't I just own a little bit of everything, right? Or I don't know how to pick the manager who's going to be able to do that. Other people say, well, I, there are some managers out there that have pretty good track records or have a pretty good uh, way of thinking about um, trying to beat the market. They're, they're going to be able to pick the particular securities in particular industries that can hopefully beat the market. And there are passive funds and there are active funds out there that are available. In general, the active funds tend to have a little bit higher fees because the management is doing a lot more for you. What's important when comparing funds is to look at the performance after the fees. So for example, if you have an actively managed fund that beats some sort of market index by 1%, but they're charging you 3%, you've just lost 2% compared to if you would have just invested in an index fund. Uh, uh, but if they beat the market by 3% and they only charge you 1%, then you get an extra 2% in your return. One of the key concepts that we also teach in finance is the power of compounding. So start saving earlier, a dollar today invested gives a return, and then you start earning money on the money that you've already got a return on, and you get the power of compounding goes way, way up. That's the benefit of investing early. The other thing to think about is fees compound as well. 
So anytime you're paying someone a fee, that's money that's taken out of your account that would otherwise be compounding over the next 10, 20 years, whatever it is. So be very, very careful about looking at the fees, particularly with index funds, because index funds are basically commodity products. They're all trying to get the same index. There's a little bit of tracking error, but the basic difference there is fees, and they're offering the same exact product, right? So that's a couple things to think about for mutual funds. Uh, the other things that uh, the other thing that mutual funds offer is daily liquidity. You can buy and sell on a daily basis, either directly from the fund or through a broker, um, and you just get whatever the values of those securities are uh, on that particular day. Uh, they're also um, fairly affordable. I mentioned the fees, but competition has been bringing uh, those fees down, and we have a lot of disclosure requirements. You can find a lot of stuff on investor.gov, or you can look at the shareholder reports, the prospectuses of mutual funds, and get very very good information. Uh, about the fees that are out there. A similar product that's gotten very, very popular uh, in the last few years are exchange-traded funds. And they are a type of open-end fund, similar to a mutual fund, but they offer um, uh, liquidity throughout the trading day. So rather than buying exchange-traded funds from a mutual fund company, you end up buying and selling them on an exchange. And there's a whole framework behind that in terms of how that works. There's a whole group of people that are called authorized participants and, 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 and market makers that keep the prices in line for those exchange-traded funds into about what they are for the weighted average of all those securities that are held in there. There's some slight deviations during the day, um, but most of the time it's very, very close. And these are very good options for people who... Um, want uh, uh, intraday liquidity for these funds. It's also the fees on these tend to be very, very low and are actually competing with mutual funds and so it can be a, uh, potentially a, a good investment for folks either combined with mutual funds in your portfolio or maybe even um, or, or moving over from uh, mutual funds to exchange traded funds. Um, one thing I do want to mention with exchange traded funds is there's a particular type of exchange traded fund that's out there um, that's called a leveraged uh, uh, exchange traded fund or an index or an inverse exchange traded fund. And what these funds do is use leverage, use debt to magnify the returns. And so there's what's called 1x and 2x and 3x funds or minus 1x, minus 2x, minus 3x. What does that mean? It means they're using leverage so that if you get an in, uh, one of these leveraged index funds that's tracking a particular index during the day, and whatever, if that index goes up 1%, maybe these things go up 2% or 3%. So they can magnify the returns on the way up, but they can also magnify the returns on the way down. So they can be particularly risky on that, but are, very, are potentially very good investments for people who need um, intraday uh, hedging strategies, more for sophisticated investors. Inverse funds basically track an index, but when the index goes up, it goes down, and it's a way for people to short the market, those types of things. Very appropriate products for trading during the day. The reason why I mention it here is for the vast majority of individuals that hold securities over not just days, but weeks and months and years, these are most likely not appropriate products to hold over the course of multiple days. And the reason why is because these things are sp specifically structured so that at the end of every day, this leverage gets reset. It's complicated, but the, but the fact remains that if you're holding these things over multiple days or months, it's not giving you what you think it's going to give you in terms of tracking the index, and, and it's not potentially not a suitable investment uh, for holding over the days. They're very suitable for intraday stuff, but we've been doing a lot working, uh, looking uh, with, with exams and enforcement actions, looking at uh, brokers and the registered investment advisors who are recommending these things that, that are not suitable or not in the customer's best interest. So I just put that caution out there for you on those. But the vast majority of ETF uh, mutual fund products are very, very uh, cost-effective way for uh, people to get uh, the only free lunch in financial markets, which is the power of diversification. Okay. Thank you very much. Now going to Commissioner Jack. Well, thank you, Jim Clayton, and I um, just want to reiterate my comments. Uh, my colleagues, thanks for your very warm welcome uh, to Dean, um, uh, to Richard Best, um, and to everybody who put so much in this event. I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to be here. And I think this is something, and I know we all agree, this is something the Commission um, needs to do, should do, and um, must do, which is find out what investors are thinking, what's going on in the markets, and how best we can help um, uh, American investors um, uh, um, use our markets uh, in the most effective way possible. Um, I'm going to just back up a moment and try and 
briefly say a little bit about why all of us are here. And I hope why many of you are here, which is that investing has the ability to change individuals' lives, to take your family from one place and one plan to another one, or to help you achieve a new career or a new goal. And I know everybody here at the university knows that investments in things like education can so often change um, one's life. And the reason we're all here is because we want to, I think, tell you a little bit about the tools that are available to you to help you do that um, and take advantage of the possibility of um, uh, changing your lives. You know, for me, uh, investing was the difference between um, uh, the honor of being uh, here and, uh, and buried for life. You know, my, I was born to um, uh, two parents in the Bronx in New York. My mom is one of nine. My father is one of five. I have 97 first cousins. <laughs> They're all here today. You can see them. <laughs> and the only reason I'm sitting here, honestly, is because my mother and father uh, believe that if they put a little money away each week, they might someday, maybe I get to go to college. That was the upside. And I'm sitting here because they believe that if you um, took Commissioner Pumbar's advice, and if you diversified and worked hard and put some money away, you could change your son's life, and that's how I ended up here. And what I want to say, if you remember anything from what I'll say, and I'll be brief, I know we're a little bit behind, is just remember that however important that mission is to you, whatever it is you're trying to achieve, ask questions when you put your money to work that reflect how important that mission is to you. Because if your family's future at stake is at stake at the path of where your kids are going to go to school or where you're going to retire or what your next career is going to be, if that's what's at stake, you should ask questions that reflect those are the stakes of the game for you. And I want to echo my colleagues who pointed out that whatever area you're interested in, you can find out more and you're entitled to know more about the choices that you're making. So the chairman pointed out that if you're going to uh, engage with a particular type of financial advisor, there's a website, it's called Broker Check, where you can go online and find out about that advisor's history. And you want to ask that question of yourself and your family, is this the person we want to trust with our financial futures? Um, as Commissioner Pivovar pointed out, I thought um, uh, very, very helpfully, you can go online and find out, this fund says that we can beat the market or that we're going to try and track a particular market, find out what market that is and why, and whether that's the one that meets your goals and your family's needs when you're making an investment. The topic I'm going to talk a little bit about is the questions you can ask of the companies that you might invest in. And I guess I want to emphasize for you that, and, and here I'm just uh, really borrowing from the chair's remarks, if you're investing in a particular company, if I were you, the one thing question I would want to answer, especially if my family and my future's at stake, is how does that company make money? What's your business? How do you actually convince consumers, or whatever your market is, to come to you and how do you turn that into profit? And I'll tell you, the federal securities laws and the work of my colleagues at the SEC gives you lots of ways to find out the answer to that question. As Commissioner Pivovar pointed out, you can go on investor.gov and, and get some information. You can go to our website and get filings that companies are required to make, and they'll have to tell you how they make money. You know, it's a funny thing. Um, we talk a lot about a, a lot of technical terms here, but um, one of the nice things about the securities laws is that they tend to sort of lay out for you the answers to questions you have if only you know the right place to look. So if you go onto our website, or what's known as the Edgar system, where you can get companies' filings, you can get a company's annual report. It's called a 10K. And my favorite item in a 10K was always item one of the 10K. When I used to teach security, so I, would, I would tell my students about this. Item one is called business. What's your business? And it's a funny thing, because for all the fancy securities learning that you hear about, a lot of people don't even read this. And if I were you, if my family's future were at stake, and I was picking a particular company to invest in, I'd be looking at item one. How does this company make money? What's its plan for the future? Is its plan for the future aligned with my plan for the future? Or, as Commissioner Pinkelbar points out, might it make more sense for me to be more diversified? Rather than betting on this particular company or this particular business plan, maybe I should diversify across potential options. There are many other places where you can go online to figure out um, what's happening in the companies you're investing in. Every year, most public companies will file what's called a proxy statement. Well, they'll have an election for the board of directors. That statement will disclose all kinds of things about the company. Just to build on something that the chairman raised, if you're going to invest in a company, you might want to know what are the incentives of the folks who run it? How do they get paid? What are their incentives? What are the targets they're aiming for when they run the company? 
proxy disclosures can tell you a little bit about that. 